Welcome to Dig, the History Podcast. On September 18th, 1814, Hendrik Cesars placed the following advertisement in the Journal de Paris. It said, quote, The Hottentot Venus recently arrived from London, now on show to the public. This extraordinary phenomenon is the only member of the Hausanana tribe ever to appear in Europe. In this woman, as extraordinary as she is surprising, the public has a perfect example of this tribe, which inhabits the most southerly parts of Africa. One might obtain at the same place an engraving of the Hottentot Venus taken from life. Entry, three francs, end quote. The Hottentot Venus's real name was Sarki Bartman, often anglicized to Sarah, Johann Wolfgang Goethe called Sarki's presence in Paris, quote, the most important event in European history. Goethe's proclamation had little to do with Sarki herself. Rather, he was referring to the debates she inspired among Paris's leading scientists. Sarki was exhibited as a specimen of natural history for some time in Paris before Hendrik Césars sold her to a purveyor of spectacles. Georges Cuvier, a prominent comparative anatomist, was convinced that Sarki was a living link between humans and lesser mammals. Her new owner allowed Georges Cuvier to study her until her early death two years after she arrived in Paris. She was 26 years old. Cuvier dissected her corpse, made a plaster cast of her body, pickled her brain and genitals, and displayed everything in Paris's Museum of Natural History. Historian Rachel Holmes has written that Sarki, quote, captured the essence of contemporary Parisian entertainment, a compound of science, phantasmagoria, fantasy, and curiosity, end quote. But 1814 Paris was not the birthplace of this troubling compound. The European public had been engaged in scientific debate for decades, gathering exotic curiosities and energetically pursuing the secrets of life. At the same time, they enslaved millions of Africans, profiting from the exploitation of their labor, along with that of American Indians and Chinese coolies, just for a couple more examples, um, and built a hierarchy of human biology, putting themselves at the top. Sarki's story, therefore, also illustrates how fuzzy the line was, and still is, between science and sexuality, classification and domination, investigation and exploitation, public health policy, and genocidal violence. This week, in episode one of our eugenics series, we will identify 18th century antecedents to eugenics, such as public sanitation, population hygiene, hereditary science, and human typologies, in order to understand the powerful impulses undergirding modern eugenics. I'm Marissa. And I'm Elizabeth. And we are your historians for this episode of DIG. We want to pause to give a big thank you to all our Patreon supporters, but especially our Augur and Excavator level patrons. Christopher, Colin, Maggie, Peggy, and Lauren, you are too generous, and we are eternally grateful for your support. Listener, if you are not yet a patron, you can be. We are halfway to our goal of $300 a month. When we hit $300 a month, we'll finally be able to upgrade our ancient recording equipment. Go to patreon.com backslash digpodcast to learn more. Though the scientific revolution took place in the 17th century, it was not until the 18th century that scientists realized they could apply the scientific method to the study of humans. The Enlightenment, 1637 to 1789, incrementally shifted the public's understanding of disease and death. 
In medieval Europe, infectious disease, human suffering, and premature death were usually understood to be providential or God's will. By the 1740s, most people were realizing what scientists had known for decades, that disease and death were preventable and that it was within our grasp to decode life's mysteries, to measure, study, and to preserve it. These powerful imperatives spawned countless scientific disciplines, epidemiology, anthropology, embryology, just to name a few. Scientific studies shifted to a clinical focus, so for the first time, scientists were applying their theoretical education to real people. They also made an effort to publish scientific manuals for lay use. This new environment produced systematic efforts towards public health directed towards sanitation and population hygiene. Most cities instituted strategic quarantines. There were municipal councils that were formed with the purpose of enforcing basic quarantine measures during times of epidemic disease. So these would kind of be part of local government. Vaccinations did not become compulsory until the 1800s, but most poor relief institutions required smallpox inoculations or vaccinations to be eligible for services. The Founding Hospital of London, for example, required wet nurses to be vaccinated for smallpox before a nursling was placed with them, and and they were paid for that. So in order to kind of get this job, Mm -hmm. they had to get um, vaccinated. The vaccination issue is super important to our series because proponents of 20th century eugenic policies justified involuntary sterilization by comparing it to compulsory vaccination, which by that time was ordinary. This was the argument that American judge Oliver Wendell Holmes used when he ruled against Carrie Buck in the Buck v. Bell case. Holmes proclaimed, quote, The principle that sustains compulsory vaccination is broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes, end quote. As municipalities collected more tax income, they made constant improvements to water delivery and waste disposal systems. 18th century public health efforts often pale in comparison to 19th century public health because in some areas, America, for example, taxation was low and irregular and therefore many states had inadequate income to build the infrastructures that were needed to execute public health efforts. In these cases, corporate or private funding was solicited for projects that were absolutely necessary. Very familiar. (laughs) Hmm. Um, Michel Foucault argues that during the 18th century, a collective ideology of health and hygiene emerged to shape public policy. Health and hygiene became subject to group decisions, problems that needed to be addressed with public action. There was a sense that everyone had a responsibility to maintain their own personal hygiene because it either strengthened or weakened the hygiene of the collective. During this period, the word clean began to uh, mean more than just neat, tidy, or washed. It meant safe and free from disease. So this is still true today in the world of sexual health. Clean means free from STIs. So if you think of like, I don't know, Craigslist ads, (laughs) you would say, (laughs) people would always say, you know, casual encounters, like looking for whatever, whatever, I'm clean and blah, blah, blah. You be clean and whatever, right? Health and hygiene. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) They do. That is what what they look like, okay? (laughs) I don't know how I know that, okay? When did they start calling it STIs and not STDs? I grew up with them being STDs. Yeah, they were STDs for me, too, Um, just more recently. I don't know. Um, The only reason I call them STIs is because that's what they call them at Planned Parenthood. So Sarah Vernon would just call them that, and so then I... Infections is better than disease, Yeah. Because it's not like you can get rid of it. It's curable. Yeah. I mean, most of them are. Wow. Health and hygiene industries thrived in this environment, right? So, for example, we had um, spring water spas. There was one in Bath, England, for example. There was all kinds of quackery, like tonics and and um, all these little devices and things that could help you with all of your problems. Um, and animal magnetism is another example, um, you know, uh, using magnets to try sort of, like, treat your life force. Mm. <laughs> 
Population hygiene, or health, depended on notions of purity and pollution. As Kathleen Brown argues in Foul Bodies, white, fresh, clean linens came to indicate good hygiene and was even an indicator of class and whiteness. It represented the control whites had over the economy and their superior access to resources. Hygienic practice marked who was white or non-white, citizen or alien, clean or contaminated, a good wife and mother or impure one. New standards of cleanliness and comportment were meant to convey to others your conscientiousness, refinement, or level of wealth. Right. So a lot of this so far is kind of review that we've talked about in various other episodes, I think. Um, But it's important to realize that it wasn't until this period that there was an idea that health had to be something that was collective. So uh, bodily hygiene became a gauge for race, class, gender, and other categories. Ignorant, provincial, country bumpkins were by default dirty and outmoded, while urban professionals were by default clean and refined. This wasn't the reality, but that was right. how people thought about it. Right. The concept of collective health and hygiene was very much related to theories of human difference. In the same way that people banded together to prevent racial mixing or, in the 20th century, um, degenerates or mental defectives, people sought to band together to prevent epidemic disease. Remember, this is a time when Western cultures struggled to imaginatively maintain the boundaries of their bodies and identities against the incursions of various others, from anything from viruses to Asian immigrants. There's this kind of idea that we're being invaded. These were very, very, very early foundations for eugenic thought, but also the foundation for many things that have been fundamentally good for society, like health insurance, routine vaccination, um, Center for Disease Control, etc. Mm-hmm. Public health campaigns were initially aimed at the affluent. Physicians identified fashionable diseases that plagued the affluent, such as nervous conditions, gout, dyspepsia, or consumption. They differentiated such diseases from those that seemed to plague the poor, such as rickets, the itch. Oh my lord, the itch sounds horrible. And alcoholism. (laughs) It's scabies. Yeah. Scabies. Oh, yuck. <gasps> they aimed maternal nursing campaigns at ladies of fashion and published books advising women of means how to care best for their infants. Over the course of the 18th century, it became clear that the European nobility were suffering from hereditary illnesses and defects because of centuries of inbreeding. For example, the last Spanish Habsburg, Charles II, was chronically ill. He had speech and feeding problems, and he suffered from impotence and severe developmental delays. He died in November of 1700 at the age of 38. Britain's King George III was known to suffer from bouts of madness and ill health from the early 1780s until his death in 1820. Incidents like these were highly publicized, and they caused anxiety about the fate of the human race, since the aristocracy was supposed to be of the purest and most noble blood in Europe. Some historians think that concerns about hereditary disease among royalty and the aristocracy also served to undermine their power in a time when it was already on shaky ground because of Enlightenment political philosophies, civic humanism, republicanism, all of these things. Think this is the time of the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, um, targeted attacks on the aristocracy uh, mm-hmm. in the media in Britain. Um, this is was kind of a time of decline for uh, the aristocracy and for people of royal blood. Right. It's it's called the age of revolutions for a reason, right? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So quickly, attention turned to improving the health of the poor. This was mostly accomplished by addressing the conditions in which they lived and their presumed ways of life. Physicians and public officials advised women on how to feed and clean their children. Foundling hospitals opened all over Europe in order to reduce infant mortality among the poor. Reformers taught the poor and working classes how to effectively clean, sanitize, and tidy. Poor mothers were educated about proper nutrition. Though scientists still understood the disease poorly, they pushed European navies to dose their sailors with sauerkraut in order to prevent scurvy. 
James Cook circumnavigated the world in 1768 and managed to not lose even one crew member from scurvy over the course of the three-year journey. Right. So they're making some, some inroads with some of these, um, some of these initiatives. The effectiveness of 18th century public health initiatives was impeded, however, by insufficient knowledge about disease. It was not entirely clear what caused disease, which diseases were infectious, and which were hereditary or environmental. For example, until the 18th century, tuberculosis and scurvy were considered to be hereditary diseases rather than the infectious disease and nutritional deficiency that we know them to be today. Medical scientists began directing their efforts towards the science of heredity. Scientists wanted to know, how does human heredity work? Which diseases are hereditary and which are communicable? What features in humans are hereditary? Which are environmental? Which are communicable? Is race hereditary or communicable? Animal breeding had been practiced for centuries, and natural scientists had been experimenting with the breeding of plant life for some time. Scientists began to wonder, can we apply these principles to humans and make human populations stronger, less prone to disease, more productive, more valuable, and I say that in scare quotes, more valuable, as part of the effort to understand human heredity, scientists turned to human typologies. In 1735, the Swedish typologist Carl Linnaeus, known as the father of taxonomy, was the first to create a human typology. He based his typology on Aristotle's great chain of being. In Aristotle's great chain of being, each species represented a link, and each was connected to other species, links, to create a chain, and their order was arranged in the order of the plan of God. He also built on the work of earlier natural scientists like John Ray, who had been collecting and categorizing plant and animal life for over a century. Linnaeus worked within this tradition to identify and classify all of society, including humanity, in search of the key to God's plan. He called his system of typology the natural order. Linnaeus's natural order was static. In his view, species were fixed and invariable. Each living creature was a copy of its parents. In his publication, Systema Naturae, Linnaeus at first classified each race as its own species. He defined each race by its, quote, essence, a platonic concept. Plato asserted that everything had an essence or eternal ideal and that all variations on this essence were shadows of the essence. Linnaeus was, therefore, describing each species' archetypes, so it was understood that there was diversity beyond the typology, but that they were based on this invariable human typology. Right, and then everyone was just sort of better or worse copies of this ideal. Right. So here were, was how uh, Linnaeus arranged his human typology. We won't go into detail with um, every you know typology that we mentioned, but um, it's kind of interesting to see this is the first time this was done. So his first human type was Homo Americanus, and so these would be how he was referring to like American Indians. Um, so they were described as red, choleric, righteous. Black, straight, thick hair, stubborn, zealous, free, painting himself with red lines and regulated by customs. So that's kind of the description, Homo Americanus. Then we have Homo Europaeus. Um, And this human is described as white, sanguine, brownie, which means like their hair, uh, with abundant long hair, blue eyes, gentle, acute, inventive, covered with close vestments, uh, meaning like wearing a lot of clothes, and governed by laws. And then he has Homo Asiaticus. Uh, These humans were yellow, melancholic, stiff, black hair, dark eyes, severe, haughty, greedy, covered with loose clothing, and ruled by opinions. And then we have, lastly, Homo afer, which uh, this these he he was referring to people uh, of African descent, black, phlegmatic, relaxed, black frizzled hair, uh, silky skin, flat nose, tumid lips, females without shame, mammary glands give milk abundantly, crafty, sly, lazy, cunning, lustful, careless, 
anoints himself with grace, and is governed by caprice. So I want to note here that Linnaeus was the first to conceptualize whiteness. So he was kind of the first person to come up with this homo europaeus and kind of put everybody, uh, you know, of European descent into this this bucket of this is what whiteness is, mm. right? Um, and he didn't use that term in his typology, but when uh, people are kind of thinking about the history of whiteness, this is where they start, start. usually. Linnaeus constantly revised and republished his taxonomy, allowing for variations that he observed, but he still thought these variations were unnatural, pulling the species further away from its natural state. In subsequent editions, Linnaeus mistakenly included various monstrous types, such as Homo monstrosus, satyrs, feral boys, and Homo troglodyte, which he asserted were ape-related species who had much in common with Homo sapiens. And Linnaeus's view, mythical and monstrous beasts, could be explained by his Platonic understanding of the world. He was focused on ideal types, and then variations of those types. So when someone had all of the features that Linnaeus attributed to their type, they were closer to perfect copies of this ideal type. If someone had some, but not most, attributes of their type, they were imperfect or even defective copies of the type that contained their essence. So this understanding of human typologies made room for monstrosity and had nothing to do with genetics. Right, so instead of looking for natural origins to these kind of monstrous humans, they were kind of saying that they were degraded or defective versions. So Frenchman Georges-Louis Leclerc, Comte de Buffon is what his title was, um, he took human typology further by offering an alternative way of understanding human variation over time. He believed that there were ancestral forms of species that originated long ago and that they changed over time based on their environments. And we know it sounds a lot like evolution, but not quite there yet. Leclerc believed in monogenism. This is the theory that all humans descended from a single origin. So he believed that the first humans were white and that their genes degraded over time based on environmental determinants, resulting in darker skin for Africans, yellower skin for Asians, and paler skin for uh, Nordic populations. Far from Linnaeus, Leclerc's typologies were based on the foundations of the budding field of hereditary science. So he's actually making room for this concept of genetic, you know, handing things down. It's not this sort of platonic idea that everyone's just a copy of their parents. Mm -hmm. He's saying, no, this is changing with every single birth, every single generation. Yeah. By System Nature's uh, 10th edition, Carl Linnaeus had revised his earlier claims, calling the different races variations of one species instead of all different species. Um, But he kept the binomial nomenclature of each race. Most historians think this means that he saw the races as discrete units and that mixing them was unnatural, even forbidden, though it was technically possible. He was confronted with racial mixing, which had been happening for centuries, right? Right. And it was becoming increasingly visible in European colonial contexts. At the same time, Leclerc posited that different species were unable to procreate with each other. So the existence or even ordinariness of racial mixing required Linnaeus to revise his assertion that each race was its own species. He just, it didn't work anymore, Mm -hmm. so he had to fix it. Right. Though Linnaeus was the first to publish a human typology, and Leclerc was the first to posit environmental determinants, they were far from the only scientists working on categorizing human difference. In the 1760s and 1790s, respectively, Englishman Henry Home, Lord Kames, and Charles White theorized a polygenist view. Charles White was the first to suggest that Negroid humans were descended from apes. This meant that the human races descended from distinct origins. From the 1770s to the 1790s, German physician and anthropologist Johann Frederick Blumenbach developed a human typology with five categories based on his research of human crania. 
John Hunter, a physician and anatomical collector um, we discussed in the forensic pathology episode, asserted that the Negroid race was originally white at birth and that it turned brown over time due to sun exposure. He noted how, when black skin scarred, the tissue turned white and suggested that this was evidence that blackness was not inherent but rather occurred incrementally over time. Right, so you can kind of see how these scientists are like grappling with their actual experience of everyday life and then trying to figure out how they can create like a, a theory that fits everything at once. Yeah. So human typologies led to the development of racial science and to the creation of race as a category. Since let's remind everyone that there is no scientific evidence that race itself even exists. Each successive generation of scientists revised the work of earlier typologists, attempting to reconcile what they knew to be true with their view of human typology. This is a great example of a time when personal and structural prejudices shaped scientific experiment and interpretation. Georges Cuvier uh, posited three races. For example, John Hunter proposed seven, Ernst Haeckel proposed 36, Julian Huxley four, Paul Topinard, uh, 19 races. Louis-Antoine de Moulin proposed 16 species. Uh, Joseph Deniker positive 17 races and 30 types. There were many attempts among white male scientists to shoehorn scientific data into their view of the world. In their world, whiteness was quickly becoming an imperative for power, respectability, and intelligence. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck developed the first coherent theory of evolution around 1800. Lamarck was the first to articulate organic evolution. He used the example of moles being blind because they live underground and no longer needed the sense of sight. He called this the adaptive force. Lamarck's most important legacy was arguably his idea of the complexifying force. He posited that organisms evolved from simple to increasingly complex forms. They moved up a ladder of progress over time. Human typology, the attempt to scientifically explain human difference, quickly became racial science and ultimately the scientific racism that came to dominate 19th century medicine. Right. So you can see uh, with all of these uh, various new theories, they're kind of being you know, applied to differentiate people of color from whites and then to put them into this sort of ladder organization where whites are at the top and then they're at the bottom. In 1798, the preoccupation with hygiene met theories of population growth. Thomas Malthus published his essay on the principles of population, which argued that population growth was outpacing our ability to grow food and would therefore ultimately lead to famine, disease, suffering, and death. Malthusian theory made the poor, the elderly, and the ill particularly vulnerable in European and American societies in the first half of the 19th century. Public officials embraced population hygiene by dismantling poor relief systems that supported those who could not support themselves. In Malthus's words, quote, if a man will not work, neither should he eat, end quote. Though it would be inappropriate to dub early 19th century poor reform as eugenics, um, it had some of the features of negative eugenic policies in the 20th century. Poor reform was aimed at preventing the support and survival of society's most vulnerable. Capital was redirected away from poor relief and toward white middle class households with stable income. So you can kind of see how, in a very indirect way, Mm -hmm. uh, this is how it was working. Yeah, basically kill kill off the ones that aren't thriving. Right. Or right. not maybe kill them off, but let them die. Let them die. Yeah. 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 So these, uh, these were scientific questions, right? But they had grave consequences for society that relied heavily on the bonded labor of Africans. Portugal, Spain, Britain, France, the Netherlands, etc., Geneticists found in the beginning of the 20th century that there was no genetic basis for race, but still, until the 1950s, human typologies remained the primary way for anthropologists to categorize human difference. 
This only changed after the horrors of the Holocaust became known. Historian Nancy Lays Steppen, an expert in the history of race and eugenics, argued in the 1980s that anthropologists clung to typology desperately because it was the entire reason for their profession in some ways. They typically measured the skulls and assessed skeletons based on racial typologies. Right, so they didn't want to let that go because that to that time was kind of like what they did even though it was kind of uh, under threat by genetic uh, studies while the intentions of european medical scientists may have been benign although they probably did have some kind of idea of hereditary superiority uh, but they wouldn't have maybe admitted that at the time um, their human typologies interest in heredity and investigations into the causes of disease had devastating consequences for marginalized groups some of the earliest recorded public health measures were executed based on principles established by racial science so putridity and miasma which were sort of bad air or like rot uh, were described as black odors even though i mean you couldn't see them but they were just described if you know, so They were described as having the color of blackness, right? Mm -hmm. So they were unclean. It was rotten air. Um, Blackness was thought to attract and retain unpleasant odor. So if you think of, like, charcoal, um, you put charcoal in your closet or whatever, and it soaks up the stinky smells, right? Mm. Um, Whiteness, on the other hand, deflected odor. So health workers whitewashed walls in order to reduce the porosity of the stone, as they said it, and to give it a, quote, clean look. Mm -hmm. So we can already see that, like, whiteness means clean, black means stinky, right? Historian William Tullett puts it this way, quote, blackness and odor thus had throughout the 18th century culture a close and enduring link that fed into the conceptualization of the putrid miasmic qualities of black skin. End quote. The persistence of enslaved blacks in the Caribbean or North and South America in harsh conditions perpetuated the idea that people of African descent were immune to diseases in ways that European whites were not. As a result, people of African descent were used as agents of public health and hygiene in ways that endangered their lives. For example, during the yellow fever epidemics in the 1790s, Philadelphia and New York, blacks were coerced into acting as sick nurses and as morticians and grave diggers because whites were convinced that their bodies were less susceptible to yellow fever infection. This, of course, was a myth. Mm -hmm. In the Americas, medical scientists influenced by European typologies produced theoretical frameworks that subjugated blacks. Philadelphia's most eminent physician, Benjamin Rush, understood blackness to be a hereditary disease of the skin related to leprosy. In an oration to the American Philosophical Society, Rush asserted that the vice of poor hygiene and eating, quote, gross animal food, end quote, such as gross meaning fatty, um, such as bacon, uh, made the... I was going to say, bacon is not gross. No, it's super good. (laughs) Um, But he meant fatty. (laughs) Um, Such as bacon. Um, So that made the ancestors of blacks more disposed to leprosy. Rush suspected that Jews were immune to leprosy because they avoided pork and committed ritual ablutions of the body and limbs. Ablutions meaning kind of cleaning themselves. Uh Meaning, he's trying to say that blacks did not clean themselves, right? Right. Uh, So we know now that this this myth that Jews could not uh, contract leprosy originates in Jews' exclusion from medieval leprosaria. And we have this in the in the, the episode. Um, Jews just weren't allowed in the leprosaria. So that's why people thought they didn't have leprosy. They yeah. just died by themselves, right? right. Um, it's interesting to think about how this theory could be damaging to both blacks and Jews. So even though they were, you know, blacks were considered particularly prone to leprosy and Jews is not, um, it could discourage racial mixing. So people if you think that blackness is a form of leprosy, mm-hmm. uh, you're less likely to have sexual contact with black people and to reproduce with with black people, right? Um, and uh, it also denigrates people of African descent because it asserts that their bodies were just irrevocably degraded. And right. that's the reason for their blackness, right? Mm-hmm. Which becomes the foundation of 19th century Ideas of almost everything, right? Um, At the same time, by proffering the idea that Jews were immune to leprosy, Jews were left more vulnerable to the disease because it was believed that they didn't need to be protected from it. Right. 
The issue was cyclical. Scientific theories were used to subjugate people of color. Then the very reality of their subjugation was, in turn, used to validate new racist theories about hygiene. Black bodies, typically enduring harsh labor and poor living conditions, were determined to have more pungent body odor than whites. Blacks were inherently smelly, dirty laborers, and had robust constitutions that were able to withstand atrocious living conditions, while whites are clean, fresh intellectuals who are more vulnerable to disease and hard living. So see how these categories reinforce racial slavery. Like Sarki Bartman's body, black women's bodies were sexualized at the same time they were othered and degraded. In Edward Long's 1774 History of Jamaica, he described the, quote, bestial or fetid smell of black, uh, which he posited was a result of the blackness of their skin. So essentially he's saying they're rotting, right? Yeah. Yeah. In 1799, Lady Barnard complained that, quote, one of the worst points of female slaves is the dreadful smell which they leave behind them. A fox is a rose to it. She also complained that she would prefer it if slaves were not allowed to attend a ball since she did not much like the smell of their oil. In the 1790s, an anonymous sex diary written in James Wilson's Almanac and it's housed at the American Philosophical Society, if you're interested in looking, the author writes, quote, lay to all night with a black winch in the inn, foul in odor, but in the breach, much the same as the white, her parts were small, end quote. Right. So people, when they were having these sort of interracial sexual encounters, were expecting uh, things about each other's bodies based on these theories about hygiene and race being kind of linked. While early public health efforts were aimed at preventing human suffering, they were also tools of social control. Magdalene societies or reform homes extended control over female sexuality. Workhouses commanded the lives and labor of the poor in exchange for meeting their basic bodily needs. Venereal disease wards excluded women patients and surveilled the sexual lives of the men who frequented them. Most obviously, they reinforced institutions of bonded labor. Once again, historian William Tullett puts this so well that I'm going to use his words. Um, quote, the association of racial odor with foul spaces such as the plantation, slave ship, poor Jewish areas of London, or the Native American hut, and the focus on stinking grease as the cause of African and Native American odor also fulfilled a use of sorts. These descriptions reinforced racial difference while expunging the less tasteful qualities of the slave trade and 18th century perfumery from polite English spaces, projecting their greasy and foul-smelling underbelly onto other bodies and spaces, thus reinforced the sweetness of English perfumery and the comfort of English houses, end quote. So it's like a way of saying, hey, we're not the ones who are doing all of this to people they are gross and living like this because of who they are. The uncomfortable connections between public health and eugenic policy exist today. Most obviously, anti-abortion activists accuse Planned Parenthood of targeting black neighborhoods. Some even use the term black genocide. The implication is that Planned Parenthood, like founder Margaret Sanger, has eugenic goals in preventing black women from procreating. And bringing us back to the story that we told at the top of the show, Sarki Bartman's body and even her corpse reinforced the idea that blacks were a lesser race than whites. The shapes of her breasts, buttocks, and labia were used as evidence that black women were sexually promiscuous, possessing an animalistic sexual impulse. Her remains were used for over a century, often by white eugenicists who sought to reinforce the scientific origins of their racist ideologies. In 2002, Sarki's remains were finally returned to her homeland for a proper burial. Then President of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki, gave a speech during her ceremony that condemned the European exploitation of African bodies. But he also used Sarki's fate to justify his problematic approach to public health. Mbeki is an AIDS denialist who challenges the connections between HIV and AIDS. 
And Becky used the history of scientific experimentation on black bodies by Europeans and Americans to justify his ban on antiretroviral drugs in South African hospitals. The ban is estimated to have caused the deaths of as many as 365,000 people. In 2009, the Young Communist League rallied for Mbeki to be charged with genocide. So there's this sort of situation that we have that this kind of horrible life that Sarki lived Mm -hmm. uh, has actually been used by politicians in South Africa to say, oh, well, uh, you know, Western society is just trying to experiment on us with their antiretroviral drugs. Right. We're not going to allow this. Right. And then hundreds of thousands of South Africans are dying of AIDS because they're not getting antiretrovirals when they first can be exposed to HIV. Right. right. And so I think, you know, I bring this up just to show that all of these ideas of public health and sexual morality and sexual health mm-hmm. – uh, are very, very bound up with ideas of class and race and colonial domination. Mm-hmm. And they always have been, uh, and they still are today. Right. Um, yeah, we don't li- we're not living in this, like, post-colonial perfect world. Right. right. No, not at all. <laughs> and, and so it's, I find it really frustrating uh, when people claim that the high, hard sciences are, like, objective and that the humanities are subjective. You know, this is kind of how a lot of scientists like to frame their right. field. Right. Um, because and, they always have, right? Right. Like, it's science. It's hard and fast. There's right. no, we, our our human emotions aren't put into this right. this hard data when in fact. Right. Which that's, you know, that's bull. Proven. That's right. over and over and over again. Right. right. So, you know, biological classification, algorithms, statistical regress- regressions, like all of these things are biased by race, gender, and other aspects of human difference and how we understand the world right. because they're made by humans. Right. Humans made the algorithm. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, it's an early example of how science and math are guided by prejudices, but I hope that our listeners can use it to understand that science and math are currently guided by prejudices. We look back and we look at Linnaeus's uh, typologies and think, wow, he's so ridiculous and racist. Mm-hmm. Um, I think 200 years from now, people are going to look at, you know, the algorithms that we write to, uh, you know, run social media right. and say, and say, wow, they brought in the rise of uh, <laughs> white, nationalism. white nationalism. Look at these assholes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's, yeah. it's, I think it'll be a really similar thing. And so it's kind of a hard uh, lesson to learn. But I think that that is one of the most important things about eugenics because it's so related to the idea of the health collective. Right. People can say that. I mean, they can say, oh, well, I'm very concerned about um, mental defectives, as they call them in the 20th century, that are degrading mm-hmm. our society. Mm-hmm. They're framing that in terms of, I want our public to be healthy. They're not framing it in terms of people who are disabled should die, you know, Uh, but that is what they're saying. But that's what they're saying. Right. That's what they're saying. Um, But it's people become convinced or they convince themselves or they convince others that that it's a health issue. Well, the, the one other thing that I wanted to mention in our discussion at the end of the episode was the idea of bodily autonomy. So I find this to be a kind of problematic uh, aspect of public health. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I see it in a lot of issues today, like with routine infant circumcision or uh, vaccination, compulsory vaccination. Um, it's it's difficult because, uh, as I said, you know, uh, Judge Oliver Wendell Holmes had said, oh, well, we make people get vaccinated. Yeah. That's the same thing as making you making like us making you tie your tubes because you're it's going for the to public good. Right. It's right. for the public good. And he, and he famously says three generations of, of imbeciles, imbeciles is, is enough. enough. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't think that the comparison makes sense at all, but I guess I can kind of understand how it made sense for them. Um, but that I I want to posit that it's this is a problem, you know, with vaccination today i'm not anti-vax by by any means at all but, but i that's also the argument that they use right right is that 
it's bodily autonomy. Mm-hmm. Like you can the gov- the state cannot make me put something in my body or put something in my kid's body that I don't want in there. And to be honest, like they kind of have a point because bodily autonomy has been disregarded, you know, in many eugenic efforts and uh in experimentation on women of color, uh, you know, it for hundreds of years. And it's like you kind of – it's like a slippery slope, right? Mm-hmm. So I kind of get it, and I really struggle with that part of vaccination and that if you're going to make people get vaccinated, it's a weird um, – I don't have an answer, obviously, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's like complicated, sticky stuff. You know, it's the, it's the good of the many versus the good of the the individual. Okay. So that's all we have for you today. Uh, If you want to uh, view our show notes or see a transcript for this episode, you can go to digpodcast.org. We have um, Twitter, Facebook, we have a Facebook group called Dig History Pod Squad. If you want to search for us there, you can join the group and... Leave us a review on iTunes. We appreciate it. Yeah, please do. Five stars. Uh, Catch you on the (laughs) (laughs) flip-flop. Will we, though? I don't even know what that means. Okay, bye. Bye. Sorry. But when I say nowadays, when I I teach in my class, I say STIs, and my students are familiar with that. So that must be what they call it now. That's what the young kids are calling it. That's what the young kids are calling it. Yep. (laughs) Um... Geneticists found in the beginning of the 20th century that there were, that there, oh my god, (laughs) gosh, kind of sounds familiar, hmm, (laughs) in Indiana in 2015, whenever the hell that thing happened. The Hottentot Venus's real name was Sarki Bartman. (laughs) Sarki Bartman. No, that was good. Um, sound like a... Uh, Sarky! What's the, what's the show where uh, the guy's Russian cousin comes? Perfect Stranger. I have no idea what you're talking it's about. It's from the 1980s. Oh. This horrible sitcom. Okay. Well, I was not alive hey, then. The old people. <laughs> Perfect Stranger. I was, Remember? I was in my mother's dreams, she told me.